Okay, uh, so is the screen visible? Okay. Yes. yes. Well, uh, so this is uh, this is the work that uh, we um, did uh, a couple of years ago, and then it got published last year on uh, Shore Independent Screening. I'll explain what that means for people who are not. Uh, familiar with the topic. And this is uh, primarily done by my, my former PhD student, Talal Ahmed, who graduated uh, and uh, now is working in a biotech com uh, company. It's uh, funded by uh, the Army Research Office in the US and the National Science Foundation. So um, not assuming too much about the background uh, of, of the audience, um, I'll just try to give a brief motivation of uh, what the problem entails. So we are living in this uh, age of uh, big data where we have all kinds of sensors collecting all kinds of information. So for example, if you have a smartphone, here many smartphones have these uh, sets of sensors. And if you did a, even a very conservative estimate, these uh, smartphones give rise to 11 million uh, numerical values, which depending upon the problem, you could treat them as samples or features and uh, we'll be treating them as features. Similarly, you have these fitness trackers. Again, if you just assume 10 Hertz uh, of uh, sampling rate per sensor, you generate 6 million samples slash features per day. And, and the basic idea is that if you focus only on one person, all the data that is being collected by different sensors, different activities, uh, you can treat that as, as features. And if you think of it that way, then it's millions of features per day that we are collecting per person. And so we are in this, uh, in this regime of basically uh, high dimensional data sets where the dimensionality of, a of data associated with one sample, uh, for example, let's take the example of uh, Angela Merkel. Uh, if you record all the activity associated with it and treat them as uh, features or they may be pro processed and put them in, in a big vector, um, you end up with P variables. And typically this P can be in today's world very large. Uh, but in order to be able to do in statistics, some kind of exploratory or predictive analytics, you of course need multiple samples. So let's say you go and uh, find another politician uh, and you collect its data and then you find basically a total of n subjects and you collect all of the, the sample for those n subjects and then you put them together. So here we have you know, Polish prime minister and Swedish prime minister and, and all the other politicians, not that I'm saying we need to study politicians that much, but you know. Uh, so we have a total of n subjects and we have a total of p variables and we are living in this regime where this p can be very huge. But let's forget about that for a time being. What can we what can we do with this? For example, a common thing is you put this um, all the data into a matrix, which is called a design matrix in the language of statistics. And you have this is an n by p n number of samples, p number of variables or features, and uh, associated with them you uh, collect some kind of response variables. So. In this case, we'll just assume that one response variable per person. And then uh, the classical problem is that you assume that uh, this uh, data is being, uh, you have a regression function f of beta, so parameterized by something called beta, and the response variable is a function of your data and this uh, regression function plus some uh, modeling error or ed additive noise, depending upon how you wanna look at it. And the idea is that if you knew this function, uh, then you can do all kinds of predictive or exploratory data analytics. Uh, what I mean by that is, let's say, once you have learned the regression function f of beta, an unknown person comes along, you collect the data for that, and you can either engage in exploratory analytics, you can say like, what are the risk factors for dropping out of high school? Uh, risk factors for joining inner city gangs, for drug addiction relapsing, not that I'm implying anything about the politicians, but you know, um, for ordinary people, predictive analytics, is the person having a stroke, heart attack, are they gonna develop Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and so forth. 
So, you know, uh, pretty much everything that you are familiar with. And the way you learn this uh, regression function is you make some assumptions about what the underlying function is. Uh, you then put it into some kind of an algorithm. And for example, if you were doing, if you were saying that the regression function is linear, you, you have a linear regression problem, then you put it through some kind of a lasso, adaptive lasso, group lasso, lower SCAD, or any of these things, and out pops the regression function, and then you are done. Okay, so this is sort of well known for for many of you, perhaps. Uh, and the the main thing here is that we want to deal with the issue of computational complexity. So when we are in this regime where p is very very large we end up in this issue of uh, that the uh, many of the methods, these optimization-based methods, tend to have quadratic or cubic complexity in P. And if this P is really, really large, then the uh, thing is that for some uh, cases, you could be waiting really long uh, to do any analysis for that. And the idea is how do we reduce the time complexity or computational complexity of this, okay? So screening is a, is a topic that, is, uh, that uh, has, uh, in, the, in the last decade or so, has become pretty popular uh, in the sense that uh, how you can relieve this bottleneck of computational complexity by basically taking your P variables now, in this high dimensional setting, the assumption is that although your response depends upon these p variables, but in reality, it depends only a, a few small number of these variables. And that's basically what things like lasso uh, operate on. And when you have n smaller than p, the number of subjects smaller than the number of variables, you can still solve the problem. But we, we want to actually reduce the complexity of the problems like lasso even further. And the idea is, well, since we know that at the end of the day, many of the variables in here, which correspond to the columns of the design matrix, they are going to be uh, not very useful in your uh, response. Why don't we discard them beforehand rather than having uh, something like lasso, discard them afterhand. Why don't we discard them beforehand? Now, that, that's a little bit of a simplistic description because there are screening methods that do simultaneously screening and something like lasso. Uh, and, and some of the work is done by, for example, Juan and Bogdan and other people. Um, so, uh, but the main idea of screening that I, I'm kind of looking at is, well, you have the response variable, you keep that, but can we, get rid of some of the predictors, some of the variables. So reduce the number of variables from P to D, such that D is much, much, much smaller than P. Ideally, maybe D is of the same size as N. And then you apply your favorite method uh, for the linear regression problem. What's the advantage? Well, the advantage is as long as you could keep the variable that contributed to the response, as long as you kept those variables within your model, uh, you haven't lost anything. In fact, you have gain in terms of speed because now what happens is that previously you were looking at computational complexity, which was polynomial quadratic cubic in P. Now you can have computational complexity, which is quadratic or cubic in D. And since D is much smaller than P, you have significantly a huge computational savings. Okay. So that's all good. Uh, the question is what is needed for practical screening methods? Now, since you are after computational screening, one, uh, uh, computational savings, one of the goals is that the screening stage itself needs to have either sublinear or linear complexity. You don't want the complexity of the screening stage to be so large that it, uh, it becomes equal to what you would have gotten if you had not done the screening. The other thing is that uh, you want the post screening variables D, the number of post screening variables D, so uh, this, I call it the post screening design matrix, 
you want that to be almost linear in n, the number of samples rather than p, and that's how you get a lot of your savings. If you if you only reduced p to let's say some constant times p, then you are not gaining a lot. We, you know, yeah, maybe you have it, but you know, if it's if you went from a million to 0.5 million, uh, it's it's not a huge savings. But if you went from uh, a million to maybe you know uh, ten thousand or fifty thousand or sixty thousand, that that's huge savings. So we want them to be on the order of n. And if you want to do the screening, then the one condition, uh, the the main question you want to address are: When can you do the screening? W what are the conditions on the design matrix, or uh, what are the conditions on your covariates or predictors or variables, whichever field you come from? And then how large can P be in relation to N so that linear screening is possible? So, so we are interested in addressing these questions, okay? Okay, so we, uh, as I said, we are, uh, we are really interested in linear uh, models, uh, linear regression models uh, to these things can be extended to generalized linear models, but uh, we are going to just focus here on a pure linear model, y equal to x beta plus epsilon. So what we are really after is ultra high dimensional model, which means that P can be uh, super linear in N, or uh, N is much, much, much smaller than the number of variables. So if you look at this data matrix X, it's really fat and short. Okay, uh, without loss of generality, I'm gonna assume the columns of X are unit norm. Screening can only happen if you assume that actually your response depends upon only a few non-zero, uh, uh, depends only a few columns of your design matrix, a few predictors. So I'm gonna model that by saying that there is a true model S and only a few of the parameters of beta are non-zero, and that defines my model. And the size of that model is k, which is uh, typically which has to be less than n, and of course that means it's much smaller than p. The noise model I'm going to assume that it's uh, just uh, IID Gaussian, but it can be extended to colored or non-Gaussian noise models. That's not a huge uh, challenge. So. So that's the setup that I want to look at. And uh, how do we get to this setup? How do we get linear time scaling? So, so the competing things are that I, I want to have low computational complexity. I want to make sure that K can be, the sparsity can be as large as possible. And the number of variables can be as large as possible compared to the number of samples. Okay, so one, uh, one very old actually approach is called marginal correlation based screening. Okay, it, it goes, the ideas go, ba go back to even something called marginal uh, regression. So marginal regression is a very old problem uh, or, and based upon that, you can come up with a very simple marginal correlation based screening. What does marginal correlation uh, means that basically you compute the correlation of each variable with your response vector individually. So you just individually ask, so basically effectively, uh, if you have the whole data design matrix, you compute simply X transpose Y. So that's going to give you P correlations. So this is a vector of P correlations. And so, so this is your X, you take X transpose, you compute Y, you get W, right? These are P correlations. And what you say is that, well, uh, if a predictor, if a variable contributed to my response variable Y, then the assumption is, well, the correlation of that variable with Y should be high, right? This is not necessarily going to be the case uh, always because there could be cancellations, right? Something could be highly correlated, uh, positively correlated. Something could be equally negative correlated and, and then the, the thing could cancel out and you wouldn't see the effect of that. 
But at some level, let's assume that, you know, th this does not happen, then a simple strategy is that you compute these Ws. These Ws are sort of like surrogates for whether a predictor, whether a variable is part of your response or not. And so what you look at is then the relative size of these Ws, the entries of this uh, correlation vector. And you say, well, if the size is large, I'm going to keep that variable in my screened model. And if the variable is, uh, if the correlation variable is small, I'm going to throw that out. So simple enough that this first operation is of course linear time order NP. And then you sort WI, then you keep only the D largest of all correlation coefficients. So computational cost is order NP. The question is, again, as I said, this, is, this cannot work for all kinds of uh, predictors. This cannot work for all kinds of design matrices. So what are the design matrices for which this simple approach will work? The second thing is how should you pick D? How large D can be? And given that, how large P and K can be in relation to N? So most screening problems or most screening literature should try to address these three problems once they have already shown that the computational savings are huge, you need to focus on this. What are the conditions of design matrix? How much to screen? And how large the sparsity can you handle? How small the number of samples can you handle? And I'll address these problems in the case of uh, an arbitrary condition that is applicable to any design matrix. So if you have different statistics on your design matrix on your predictors, you can see whether these conditions are satisfied for that or not. And I will show a special case of sub-Gaussian design matrices where these con uh, the conditions I'm gonna present are trivially satisfied. And then I'll also show that the results that we have derived are pretty tight for marginal correlation-based screening, which means that the results we have cannot be improved upon, at least order-wise, for marginal screening problems, okay? Uh, before I, I, I go ahead, I just wanna point out that screening, uh, even the marginal correlation is an old idea. Uh, Marginal correlations for screening sort of uh, got, became really famous about 12 years ago with, with this uh, seminal work of Fan and Love. They were then used, uh, extended to generalized linear models, semi-parametric models, non-parametric models. Uh, people extended that to the case where you are not just computing the Pearson correlation, but also candle rank correlations, generalized correlations. These are all the works that say uh, the, the vision that I described earlier, which is you screen, and then you leave it up to the user to do what you want to do with the small model. In contrast to that, uh, there are other works that basically are tied to which screening, which uh, regression method you are gonna use at the end of the day. Uh, so while this method, for example, once, you have done screening, a new regression method comes up, you could just use the screened model and apply that. These results, uh, a bunch of very beautiful results. Um, and uh, I, I, the, the reason I'm giving this talk is I became aware of this work uh, 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 from people on this call uh, called Slope, right? And uh, these works basically apply to sort of lasso type, not exactly lasso, but lasso-ish kind of things. So they are tied, the screening and, and, uh, uh, and the regression is kind of tied together. Whereas what we are looking at is, well, we don't care what regression method you are gonna use at the end of the day. And so, so one question that comes to mind is if screening, correlation-based screening has been studied so well, why do I need to do that? And the reason is that there are, there are some things that are kind of hidden in the analysis of screening. In particular, there is a dependence on um, 
what we call minimum to signal ratio that is kind of hit, uh, that doesn't show up in this analysis because of the uh, because of the way the problem has been set up. So we want to bring that uh, dependence out. And also we don't want to specifically say, oh, it's only ap applicable to sub Gaussian matrices. Maybe you just are given just one realization of the design matrix. You don't know what the underlying distribution is. You just want to check with whether screening would work or not. And so we give conditions for that. And so what we are really doing is marginal screening in, in the way of like fan and lens, except that we have a different analysis. And so we, we call it extended shore independent screening where the shore um, word means that you are guaranteed with very high probability to retain all the important predictors. And independence means that you are uh, screening each variable individually. So this is sort of like the setting up the problem, the backstage, the motivation. I think th this, you know, um, I, I was told uh, the, in this seminar, most of the questions happen at the end, but I think this is a good time perhaps to take a sh little bit of a short break and ask if there are any questions uh, so that we can clarify the, the basics, the ground rules, the, the, the settings before I go into the uh, technical details of the results. So, so are there any questions that I could address at this point? Uh, yes. Please. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, so if you screen um, before and it does not depend on the estimators, you, you mm -hmm. may change the estimator at the end. Right, so, so, so if the estimator is really, if your assumption is that y equal to sum of all these predictors, but the many of the predictors are, uh, non, uh, are not playing a role, then you can also write it as y equal to sum of the other predictors. So as long as you're screening, and that's why the, the, the issue of shore is very important. If you can guarantee that none of the important predictors were thrown out, then you haven't changed the problem, right? So, so, so that's the key. You have to ensure that none of the important predictors were thrown out. Okay, because you're assuming a perfect uh, sparse linear model. Exactly, exactly. So, so if you have a perfect sparsity, then uh, I haven't changed it. If you have uh, if you have approximate sparsity, then yes, I'm going to change some of the things. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, so uh, I, I presume then we are all on the same page. Uh, maybe, maybe I you know belabored some of the points because I wasn't too sure of the audience, so, uh, but I think it's good to, to be on the same page about everything. Okay, so let's now talk about sufficient conditions for access. So our analysis is based upon two sufficient conditions, which we call screening condition, KB screening condition. It says that, let's assume that you have, so, so you have a linear model and let's assume that the regression vector is perfectly sparse, so it's K sparse. We say that the design matrix satisfy the KB screening condition if there is a parameter B, which is no bigger than one over square root of K, such that these two inequalities hold screening condition one and screening condition two. So let's dig into them. What do these conditions say? These conditions are basically uh, effectively looking at when you do marginal correlation and if you were to write out, if you were to write out the marginal correlation expression, right? What do you get? You get inner products of each, co uh, each predictor with all the other predictors. Now, ideally, if all the predictors are orthogonal, right? Then actually something like marginal correlation is beautiful. If all predictors are orthogonal, the effect of other predictors will disappear Right? And, and you will just see whether the predictor you are checking for exists in the model or not. But the reality is since you have a fat matrix, the predictors are not, of course, are not going to be orthogonal. So what this condition is saying is, uh, 
pick up all the so first of all between the predictors between the variables that are within your model the cross correlations between the predictors when you sum them all up and also look at them with respect to beta so it's not just the correlation it's not xi transpose xj but you are involving beta j within it <clears throat> if you take the cross correlation with respect to any k sparse beta then they, that shouldn't be too large as a size of your regression parameter vector this ensures uh, that your so so what does this ensure this ensure that actually any relevant predictor when you check its marginal correlation is not does not get canceled by other uh, presence of other predictors they don't combine to suppress the response of your correlation of your own of the predictor that is actually present okay so so that's the the first condition is saying if there is a predictor which is in the model it shouldn't be killed by other predictors that are in the model in terms of correlation when you take the correlation it shouldn't be the the correlation of that with other predictors should not blow up that it kind of like you know it can with an appropriate negative sign it kills it the second condition is about the uh, about the predictors that are not in the model now you say why do i care about them well we do care about them because if you want to screen the first condition is making sure that when you go for screening you don't lose important predictors the second condition ensures that when you go for screening you can actually screen a lot of redundant predictors that are not there so the first ensures you don't lose the second ensures that d is really small what's the second condition the second condition says that if i pick any irrelevant predictor that was not in the original model and i compute its correlation that cannot be too large okay that that has to be uh, the two norm divided by at least square root of k so so hopefully the screen condition intuitively like makes sense what what they are doing the first one make sure you don't lose the true predictor the second ensures that you can get rid of as many non true predictors as possible okay so the first one ensures sureness the second one ensures that d is really small okay so we armed with that we can give a statement like this that assume the x satisfies the screening condition then if the minimum smallest the the bang, uh, the the magnitude of the or the contribution of the smallest predictor the weakest predictor in your response divided by the energy in the all the predictors has to be large enough this condition again comes up because of the sureness property we don't even if the smallest predictor is very small we want to make sure we don't lose it so that goes back to what quentin asked about right we want sureness and that's why this property is there then it says that with very high probability the model returned by axis will retain all the two columns so it will retain the the reduced matrix will have the same uh, will will have all the important predictors within it as long as you pick d to be square root of k over this thing so if we parse this what do we see we see that d depends upon sparsity parameter which makes sense right the the bigger the more Uh, the less sparse you are the more non zero coefficients you have the more you should retain makes sense 
but it also depends upon what we are calling minimum to signal ratio, okay? What it says is that if, if your minimum value is too small, if the minimum relative, like all the other predictors are contributing, let's say one, and one predictor is contributing 0 0.01, you have to actually retain more D. You have to screen less aggressively because there is a possibility that one, that small predictor could be killed if you go too down. It also depends upon the signal to noise ratio, so, so sigma squared over beta two. And in general, if you say that, and I'll explain this better but, uh, later, but if you just think of this, that this whole thing is like one over square root of K. Remember, we want B, the screening parameter to be less than one over square root of K, right? So let's say that this whole denominator, uh, new, uh, denominator was like one over square root of K, then you are saying that D has to be at least a factor of k, which you know makes sense, square root of k times square root of k. You need to retain at least k uh, of the predictors to make sure that all the k predictors are retained, right? But of course, they, they, you know, so so with with a few uh, factors here. So this is sort of the general result. But this result is not very very. Uh, uh, useful in the sense that <clears throat> you cannot verify the screening condition, right? Uh, I mean, the screening condition is like, you know, those uh, restricted eigenvalue conditions of Lasso or the restricted isometry property kind of conditions of Lasso, which require, which says, oh, it, this must be satisfied for every B or every beta, right? So you, you're not gonna be able to verify that because you need to look through combinatorial, you need to look at combinatorial searches. In fact, there is a, there is a work out there that formally showed that uh, you cannot actually uh, certify things like RIP uh, because it's NP hard problem. Right? Uh, so, what, so uh, what do we do? Well, we go to two cases, the, the usual trick, right? Uh, like when people say, oh, restricted eigenvalue property or, or uh, incoherence condition or uh, restricted uh, I, uh, you know, eigenvalue or isometry property or whatnot or a null space property, all of these things. Then they take the special case of Gaussian matrices or Gaussian design and show that it holds. So we wanna do that too. But then we also wanna talk about actually the case when you don't have the right distribution, maybe they are not sub-Gaussian, maybe you cannot figure out they are sub-Gaussian, you, you only got one shot at the problem. You don't have enough data to actually determine the underlying distribution of, the, of your predictors. Uh, then what you can do is uh, you can still use two measures of your design matrix. One is very well known in the statistics community called worst case coherence. But, there is an, but that leads to worst case analysis. There is another one where you say, I want to actually recover most of the models, not all the models, then actually you can get better results through something called the coherence property, uh, which generalizes the worst case coherence idea. So, so let's look at that for these cases, okay? So this is sort of like the second half where we, we are very abstract in terms of the screening condition uh, and giving somewhat of a uh, sort of a very broad picture. And I think I can also take questions at this stage before I give results for sub-Gaussian matrices. Okay, uh, I'll keep going then. So let's look at the screening condition for sub-Gaussian matrices. Uh, sub-Gaussian matrices, uh, have, the assumption is I'm gonna assume that the design matrix, every entry is the independent realization of a zero mean sub-Gaussian random variable with parameter bj and variance sigma j squared. Uh, so I mean, what, what's a sub-Gaussian random variable? It's basically a random variable whose moment generating function is uh, majorized by that of a, a Gaussian random variable effectively 
a sub Gaussian random variable has tail that grows no faster, uh, uh, that uh, uh, no no slower than the Gaussian distribution, right? So it can go, go grow fa it can go to zero faster. It it cannot be so effectively. You are uh, ruling out uh, things that decay whose distribution decays very slowly. If you do sub-Gaussian random variables using uh, uh, simple analysis of uh, concentration of major inequalities, you can actually show there are sub-Gaussian random uh, matrix, a uh, design matrix satisfies both the screening conditions with a parameter which is square root of log P over N. And uh, we remember we wanted it to be smaller than one over square root of K. So this is uh, be, uh, this is definitely since k is smaller than n, this is uh, good. Um, this b star and sigma star they are just the uh, parameters that we can ignore. So what we have is that a sub Gaussian data matrix satisfies the screening condition with parameter log p over n square root, and if we plug that in into our original theorem, this is what we get. <clears throat> we see that we get the condition that the sparsity shouldn't be bigger than n over log p, the classical sparse regression setup, n over log p. n is the number of samples. So you can't have more sparsity than n over log p. Okay, good. And the, the log p can be as large as n, so you are allowing for, uh, you are allowing for ultra high dimensional models. And, then as long as this condition is satisfied, which is again, the minimum to signal uh, ratio, which means that the smallest, the, the contribution of the smallest predictor shouldn't be too small relative to the total contribution of all the predictors, okay? If that is satisfied that as long as D is greater than or equal to N over log P, which is of course bigger than K, Right, because k is less than or equal to n over log p, you are guaranteed to make sure that you don't lose out on any important predictors. All the correct predictors are kept in the model. So the main things are, you know, <clears throat> in sparse regression, what, what are you after? You want to make sure that the sparsity, you can handle linear scaling of sparsity, good, checked. You can handle ultra high dimensional data sets checked. And then the reduced model is approximately of the size N. The reduced model has, now, now you have actually, in fact, it has become, uh, if you picked N over log P, you have in fact made your problem uh, not, no longer even uh, uh, high dimensional. N becomes then, small uh, n becomes greater than d in that case okay because the new problem is dimension n by d right okay so so this is the result for for gaussians and this result in fact uh, matches uh, with the uh, gaussian result that fan and lab had in the original shore independent screening paper except that this dependence is, is not coming out in that work uh, because of the way they have, they, they make an implicit assumption that kind of hides this dependence. And one could say, well, maybe, maybe the analysis in our paper is loose and actually this dependence is not real and I'll show results in the later that actually no marginal screening can avoid this dependence. Like even, even if you had Oracle, which said, keep on increasing D till I recover all the correct predictors, you will see that if, which makes logical sense, but if the contribution of the smallest one is too low, you have to increase the number of uh, the dimension that you need to keep, okay? Okay, so let's look at the arbitrary matrices. What if you cannot ascertain the distribution to be Gaussian? Well, uh, one approach is what's called the coherence, right? 
you we have unit norm columns. So coherence is defined as basically um, th there shouldn't be a transpose here or or there shouldn't be an inner product sign. Uh, I'm just so th that's a typo. But basically, <clears throat> what this is saying is compute that the pairwise correlations of your predictors. And we already said the predictors are unit norm, so uh, the non normalization. <clears throat> And use that to uh, to figure out what the screening condition will be. What's the advantage of this? This can be computed in polynomial time. This, this is computable explicitly. Uh, there is an issue there. There is something called the Welsh bound, uh, which tells you that if you have a matrix, that bound has nothing to do with, it's a linear algebra question or frame theory question, which is that if you have a matrix which is fat and short, so N is smaller than P, then in fact, this bound can be no smaller than one over square root of N. So, so we know, of course, you know, if, the, if N was equal to P, this can be zero, right? If n is if n is equal to p, this is can be zero. You take orthogonal columns. That's zero. But the moment you start adding more columns, this cannot be smaller than one over square root of n. Okay. So <clears throat> there's a limit to how small this can be. <clears throat> so using a simple triangle inequality, basically you can compute. The, this part of the screening condition, right? You apply the triangle inequality, absolute value on the inside, then that's just the absolute value on these things. And the one norm of beta and the absolute value is bounded by mu and one norm can be bounded by two norm times square root of k. So simple triangle inequality tells you that the screening parameter of any matrix is upper bounded by mu times square root of k. But this is really a conservative result. Why? Because take k to be n. So this is mu times square root of n, right? But we know that mu can be no bigger than square root of n. So, so that will become uh, one. And that's not allowed in screening condition. You need the screen condition to have one over square root of k. So the only way you will get one over square root of k here is if k was in turn square root of n. Right? So, uh, or, or, or n was at least uh, k squared, let's put it that way, right? So this is a really conservative uh, estimate. If you do that, then this is, and plug it into the previous formula, you get this result, which is the same that you can screen as long as the number of parameters d is greater than square root of n. Now, uh, as I said, this may seem surprising. You are saying, oh, I can screen up to as small as, square root of n, that sounds like magic, but the, but the reality is it's not because, because of the Welsh bound, we are also requiring that k is no bigger than square root of n. So th th this thing, which is typically called in sparse regression, the square root bottleneck. This is called square root bottleneck because uh, uh, when you use worst case coherence, when you use the coherence parameter, you always hit up against this Welsh bound, which gives you the square root model like that. The sparsity can be no bigger than square root of n. Okay. And, and that's, a, that's a very well-known kind of a phenomenon. And if you just focus on worst case analysis and you don't assume anything about the underlying distribution of the of your uh, predictors, you cannot improve upon that. There are worst case results that, that show that you cannot improve upon that. 
However, if you insist, if you say, I don't want the model to be recovered. So, so the screening condition says, fix a design matrix and have any model that you want, I will guarantee that any model you give me can be screened. But there is, a, there is an also a sort of a typical model uh, statement where you say, well, give me a matrix. And for most models, it will be able to screen it. Which model it will be able to screen it is a function of the matrix. So give me a different matrix. It will also be able to screen most models, but which the one that this one will screen will be different than the ones that this one will screen. But the fraction that any one matrix cannot screen is very, very small. So what's the condition that we, we introduce something called average coherence. Average, so, so the issue with worst case coherence, let, let me just give you a brief thing, right? <clears throat> the issue with worst case coherence is that, see this quantity is looking at absolute value of Xi transpose Xj beta J and there can be some cancellations happening within this summation. But when I do, uh, when I actually apply triangle inequality, I have now taken the absolute value inside, I get rid of any possibility of cancellations. So the average coherence kind of takes care of that and says, well, you know, I should really look at how these average, like compute all the correlation, but don't put absolute value signed right there. Right. And now see how does this whole thing uh, behave and maybe uh, take a, an average of that. So, so of course, compute it for everything except your own self because that will be one and divide it by all the pairs, which is P minus one. And ask yourself, what is this quantity? If this quantity is small, then it, it suggests that cancellations happen within the screening condition, okay? Okay, so um, what we want is then something called coherence property, which we introduced uh, about a decade ago in the context of um, uh, compressed sensing problems. The coherence property says that your worst case coherence should be no bigger than one over square root of log P. And your average coherence should be worst case coherence divided by square root of N or smaller. So what they say is that your worst case coherence is whatever it is, but you want to make sure that when you don't put the absolute values inside, there are cancellations that are happening. Because if the cancellations didn't happen, then mu x will be equal to mu x. The average coherence will be equal to the worst case coherence. But we are requiring that cancellations happen. Okay. So if I go with this, then actually we can show that any matrix that satisfies the coherence property in fact, so, so that was a decade old result which we did in relation to uh, sparse uh, recovery problems. But what we found out is that any, any design matrix that satisfies the coherence property will actually also satisfy the screening condition with parameter mu times square root of log P. So remember, when we used worst case coherence, we had square root of K here. So I have been able to, to get rid of K and instead replace that with log P. So now if mu is one over square root of K, I get back the, what I wanted except the log fact, okay? So, if I plug now this kind of screening condition, so, so I say, well, assume the matrix satisfies the, the uh, coherence property, 
Then I get back the result that I had for um, the sub Gaussian matrices, except again, the, the, it's again a high probability result. But the probability is now also on uniform priors over all models. Okay, so, so the difference is the Gaussian model said, if, if the Gaussian design matrix is good, it's good for all models. This problem is saying that the matrix is good for a large fraction of models. So that's, that's a typical versus uh, worst case analysis. But the result is very similar to what we have for Gaussians, linear scaling of sparsity K, ultra high dimensional data sets, cardinality of screen model is N over log P. Now you may ask, you know, are there, are there matrices that satisfy that coherence property? And the answer is yes. Uh, this is something we did uh, in 2012, where we showed that Gaussian matrices, binary, random binary matrices, uh, Fourier matrices, Gabor matrices, chirps, a bunch of other things, in fact, satisfy the coherence property with a, uh, with, with a lot of room. As long as, uh, th th these are sort of like asymptotic results, uh, but uh, sorry, non-asymptotic results, which show that beyond this, you start to, uh, to satisfy it. But even for smaller problems, we have seen that it seems to work pretty well, okay? So, so this is basically the proof that I could have actually used the fact that Gaussian matrices satisfy coherence property to obtain the result. The difference will be the result in that case will be for typical models in this, whereas the result I derived earlier is for all models. Okay. So since I'm running out of time, I'm gonna quickly show one thing, which is that our result showed that there's a, small, a strong dependence on the minimum to signal noise ratio. I wanna prove that. Uh, new, uh, through experimentally, experimentally. So take a design matrix 500 by 2000 uh, and very small sparsity k equal to five. And then what I would do is the non-zero entries will be distributed uniformly between one and E and I'll increase E. So the bigger the E is, the, the bigger the chance that, you know, I will have uh, that mi some of the elements will be far away from the average contributions or, or total contributions of all the predictors. And this is what you get. The, this plot is actually showing two things in one case. One is the effect of worst case coherence. And the other is the median minimum model size. Okay, this, this is all Oracle based. This is not, this, this is showing that if you had an Oracle when would the, and the Oracle kept on increasing the size, when will the Oracle say, stop, 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 you have gotten everything you need, okay? So when the coherence is of course very small, you don't uh, need, uh, but you see that as the coherence, so, so there are two aspects we are determining here. One is as coherence increases, indeed you need bigger, model, you need D to be larger. So for every curve, you need D to be larger. So one curve is for one uh, E and, and then we just design the matrix to ensure that the worst case coherence was bigger. <clears throat> so, so this is the case where you increase coherence, you have to make the model larger. But then these different curves are, this one has the uh, the minimum value of this, the minimum to signal ratio of this is much uh, smaller. And so you need, uh, the minimum model size needs to be much larger for this problem. Here, the minimum to uh, cumulative contribution is much, uh, is, is not too small. And so the minimum mo uh, model, you, the Oracle needs is pretty, small relative to this, it's about six times smaller. So you can see that E became about five and, and this is about, you know, uh, about five or six times smaller. 
Okay. And this is this is the same where I'm now showing the the whisker plots, which show that in that previously I was just showing the median. Now I'm showing the whole whisker plot, and you see that uh, for large coherence, sometimes the oracle needs says that you know what you have to retain the entire p. You can't discard anything. So, so the range goes up to 2000. So, so there is no way you can improve upon the result because some of the models, some for some uh, parameters beta, you have to retain everything, right? If you order them, some of the important predictors fall way at the bottom. And, and so you have to go there. This is all Oracle based. So then there are other results here. Here is the result with uh, methods of sure independent screening with uh, with the, what are called safe and strong rules. I didn't get a chance to actually compare with the slope method. Uh, so you know that's one of the things that I'll be happy to chat after the call. Uh, but for safe and strong rules for lasso and uh, they, they exist for both lasso and elastic net. Um, you see that, well, the, of course, you know, access is going to give you just one number, right? <clears throat> Whereas the screening rules for last, so uh, the, they, the screening depends upon Lambda. So you look at that and you say, oh, when Lambda becomes, you know, very uh, large, which is the outcome is sparser, you are screening way fewer number of parameters. Okay, yeah, sure. But then we have to look at the detection rate, how, what was retained and what was not. If you look at what was retained, actually the reason the retained model is becoming smaller is because, the, because Lasso has started to basically just throw out everything. The retained model is very small and this is the, it is, effectively around here, it is detecting only 60% of the correct model. Whereas for this value of the model size, uh, sure independent screening is retaining all the more correct predictors. So it is doing sure, the sure part is there. Whereas the safe and strong rules are uh, not able to maintain. So, so they do maintain up to here, uh, but they fall very quickly and uh, they stop detecting the whole thing. So, so they, are not sure, they are not sure in that regard. And similar kind of results can be seen for if you use safe and strong rules for elastic net. Uh, there, there's a real world problem where we show you know, the speed up and comparison with just lasso, the uh, in, in terms of the downstream task of uh, estimation and the performance degrade very uh, small. So I, I'll conclude with this, which is that, you know, sure independent screening uh, has been there for a long time, but what we were able to do was provide uh, an analysis that helps us understand what is really affecting the performance of sure independent screening. And uh, in particular, focus on the case where the distribution of your predictors is not very well known, and you can still derive results or guarantees uh, for those kinds of problems. So with that, uh, I'll conclude. Uh, thank you for, uh, again, uh, hosting and for, for giving me the opportunity to explain the work. <laughs>